Welcome to the third meeting this year of the Game Development Guild. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Jess Morissette. He's worked on a few small titles and a few other video game related projects. I'll let him talk about those, so let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Let's see if PowerPoint actually wants to cooperate today. Okay, so... Just want that view. Yeah, oops. Very top. Very top. Is it display settings? There we go, that looks a little bit closer. Uh, I was trying to think of a title for my talk today. What I eventually came up with was tips for success from a guy who probably has no business giving the game dev talk. Um, the reason for that is, uh, the reason I, I sort of framed it that way, um, my experience is mostly limited uh, to a few small titles. Uh, these are non-commercial games, uh, they're indie titles, uh, games that are reaching you know, several thousand players. I've been lucky enough to get some play out of them, but not the sort of thing necessarily that, you know, uh, putting any money in my pocket or getting a ton of attention. But in working on these sorts of projects, uh, I think I've come away with maybe some useful lessons, especially for a lot of us who are starting out, maybe working on solo projects or projects with a small group of people. Uh, I'm hoping I have a little bit of wisdom to share based on some of the things that I've done wrong along the way, that maybe my team's done wrong along the way, and maybe some advice on maybe some best practices as well. Um, so. Where I want to begin is talking about my personal experiences as a gamer. I'm a professor of political science here at Marshall. Uh, formally, I study international relations. I study foreign policy, world affairs, that sort of stuff. Uh, but for the last several years, a lot of my attention has turned to studying uh, pop culture, the politics of pop culture, and specifically to looking at political themes in video games. And this is a reflection of a lifetime spent as a pretty avid gamer. It goes all the way back to the mid-1980s. Um, old adventure games, um, like the King's Quest series, King's Quest II, uh, was a game I got with my very first computer at Christmas of 1986. So, considering that you said you played King's Quest, what was your favorite Death in those games? Oh gosh, well, I'm gonna get to that. Anytime you can fall off a staircase, and I'll tell you why that's the case. <laughs> Uh, I, fell in, I fell in love with uh, the Space Quest series and other set of adventures. Probably my favorite game of all time, uh, The Secret of Monkey Island. Uh, sort of a humorous point-and-click adventure game, one that I still love dearly. I have that image hanging up and it's a giant poster uh, in my office still today. Uh, this sort of narrative-driven, puzzle-solving style of game was always what excited me. It's what I've worked on as I've now had my chance to create games. It's sort of a dead genre, it's coming back a little. Uh, it's a retro genre, no doubt, but that's where my passion lies. It's always lived there. From the time I was a kid, 10, 11 years old, I was drawing fan art from these games. I was writing fan fiction. Uh, I was sort of writing up design documents for sequels that I was imagining in my head that would never come to anything. Uh, I tried to film a fan movie of King's Quest II one time with a couple of my friends. It was abysmal. I'm glad those tapes no longer exist. And once I went to college, I'm old enough that my freshman year of college was the first time I'd ever seen the internet. I didn't know the internet was a thing until I got to our computer lab my freshman year and someone said, check out these computers. They can do stuff online. And I start looking at it, and I start checking it out, and I start realizing, like, man, I want to do something with this. I want to take my love of video games and try to contribute something um, online. What that ended up being was a website that I launched in 1995, uh, Roger Wilco's Virtual Broom Closet. It's dedicated to that Space Quest series that I mentioned on the last slide. It's a website full of fan fiction, favorite quotes, Easter eggs, downloads, all the sort of stuff that we associate was sort of an old school fan site that you would find uh, back in the early days of the web. In fact, there's, uh, there's reason to believe, I've made this claim a few times and nobody's disputed it, this may have been one of the first video game fan sites on the internet. Uh, as far as you go back for the web, I can't really find much evidence of anyone having one out there much earlier 
than 1995. So, so my love of video games very quickly transferred uh, to the internet. More recently, uh, probably what I'm best known for these days as far as video games, uh, started with, oops, started with this tweet that I made back in August of 2016. Uh, why isn't there a Tumblr consisting entirely of screenshots of soda machines from video games? This one's from Batman uh, Arkham Knight. Uh, it was a throwaway tweet, it was something of a joke. I started posting a few more soda machines after this. Pretty soon a lot of my followers started sending me soda machines. And before I knew it, I was running a website called the Video Game Soda Machine Project. <laughs> Uh, where I do nothing but collect screenshots of video game soda machines. How many might that be, you might ask, in two years' time? I have 2,400 uh, soda machines now archived at my website. Uh, and this is the sort of thing, it's a dumb enough idea that it's starting to gain a little bit of attention uh, from the games media, because what else are games media going to write about, right? Uh, Slate.com. <laughs> Uh, runs a piece when I uh, archived my first 500 soda machines. I guess they're probably being sarcastic when they call me a genius, because I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, Kotaku did a little bit of coverage of it. Um, we have Game Informer, who just a couple of months ago did, uh, did a print article about uh, my work on this. Other sites, uh, the Onion AV Club, one man's mad quest to capture all the video game soap machines. I think that's about accurate. Yeah, no, exactly. Mad quest is putting it probably kindly. Um, but yeah, this is something that kind of turned into a weird hobby, and it's actually started influencing my research. I've used it as a springboard to talk about how we represent consumerism and capitalism in video games. So I've kind of spun it back to my own real job uh, for my hobby. But I'm not here today to plug my site. That's the last thing I want to do is come here and try to get you guys to run up the hits on my website. That's not what this talk is about today. So I'm not going to plug it. Uh, that, whoa, how did that even get up there? Uh, <laughs> You're saying? Yeah, I know. That's awful. Uh, what I do want to talk about is my experience in game development. I came about it in a little bit of an odd way. I dreamed of doing game development kind of my entire life. It was something that... I'd always had a passion for, something that really intrigued me, something that I didn't know if I could ever get a chance to do, but was always kicking around the back of my head. And back in 2012, I saw an opportunity. Some of my, uh, some of my friends that I'd made uh, during my time running that fan site that I mentioned earlier, Space Quest uh, fan site, uh, had launched a Kickstarter. The designers of these original games from the 1980s were kickstarting a whole new game. It was called Space Adventure. And it was during that period where video game Kickstarters were kind of going crazy. Uh, the uh, Double Fine Adventure had just raised like a mountain of money. Uh, other retro adventure games were also seeing a lot of success on the platform. And this game being developed by some of my friends, some of my childhood game design heroes, that I've been lucky enough to get to know through the years through running my site, was about to fail its Kickstarter. It was kind of on the bubble. Uh, they were paid into the last week or so, and it wasn't clear if they were going to be able to make it. So I came up with an idea. My thinking was, if I can design a quick adventure game, if I can put together a team and put together a little adventure game about this Kickstarter and get it out there, Maybe the media will cover it, because it seemed like a good headline. You know, fans of Space Adventure Kickstarter create game to promote Kickstarter. And the whole purpose of the game, which would come to be known as Pledge Quest, was you go through a series of puzzles so your main character can eventually pledge to the Kickstarter. Basically, it's a game about supporting a Kickstarter in order to support a Kickstarter. That's good. Yeah, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's kind of a crazy idea, but what we had was basically 48 hours to pull it off. I pulled together a couple of friends that I'd known for years, and we got to work on it. And what came out of it was Pledge Quest, the Space Adventure Adventure, uh, as it was called. We later followed up with a sequel, Pledge Quest 2, Noodle Shop of Horrors. That game's about a time-traveling cat who builds a time machine out of a toilet. It's kind of complicated. Uh, but 
It was really my first foray into uh, uh, game design. It got a little bit of attention. The Kickstarter was successful. I don't know if my game had much to do with tipping it over the edge, but it was sort of what I could do at the moment to try and make that happen. And I thought I'd do a short clip here, assuming uh, PowerPoint will play nicely with me, from my first game. Uh, well, actually, this is the sequel to it, Pledge Quest Two: Noodle Shop of Horrors. So that's just a short bit. It's, it's a, I think, total something like six rooms. And this sort of interaction you're seeing here, look, touch, slash use, smell, taste, talk to, sort of the standard, if you played many adventure game, uh, games along the way, the standard set of verbs you tend to see in a game like this. And the whole purpose is her cats traveled through time, erased her favorite video game from the timeline, and she has to figure out how to go back and set things <coughs> right. Uh, and it's a pretty simple game, uh, in the sense of, you can see uh, fairly low-res graphics. I think it's 320 by 240 is the, uh, is the resolution on this. Uh, sort of a classic MIDI-style soundtrack, all the sorts of things you'd expect to see uh, from this sort of era that we're trying to evoke. Uh, but the main thing we were trying to do with these games was get attention. We were trying to get attention for this other project. And we had some success there. As I said, there was a little bit of media coverage. It got a little bit of excitement going. Some people said things like, well, I'm going to up my pledge because I can see that there are some dedicated fans out there willing to go the extra mile. It got the job done, and that's great. Secretly, more importantly for me, I was like, holy crap, I got to make a game. I got to write things that then popped up on a screen when I said, lick the mirror. And that's kind of the greatest feeling in the world. You guys know that. You've developed games uh, before. There's nothing better than seeing your work pop up on the screen in front of you, no matter what form that work takes. And this was super rewarding for me. It was something I never thought I would get to do. Uh, and luckily, I had a chance to do it again. I took that initial team. It was me and uh, a woman that I'd known through my um, Space Quest fan site for years that worked on the Pledge Quest games. Um, I assembled a larger team for our next project. In 2015, we released a game jam game called Late Last Night. Uh, this was originally completed in two weeks for a game jam. The uh, the premise here is something kind of like a drunken Alice in Wonderland. Our main character, Morgan, is out on, that, on the town for a night of drinking. She has a little bit too much. She loses her keys, her cell phone, her cigarette lighter. And now she's going through this drunken fantasy wasteland trying to recover her lost items uh, before the night is over. Uh, we'd eventually release a special edition of this where we went back added a few more puzzles, but most importantly, uh, did a fully voiced version of it. So we actually got a cast together, recorded uh, vocals for the entire game. Uh, there were a thousand lines of dialogue packed into three, uh, three screens, three rooms of, uh, of gameplay. Uh, but this is a game, again, we're trying to go back to that sort of old school feel. This looks a little bit more like maybe some of the classic LucasArts games. We were going for almost a 
Day of the Tentacle vibe, if that's a familiar game to any of you guys, or something a little bit more absurdist like a Sam and Max. This scene that I have here, that's going to be part of the gameplay demo, takes place in the uh, junk food forest. You can see uh, we have some cotton candy bushes, we have some french fry uh, fronds there, we have a bacon tree, uh, we have a cake trailer sitting in front of it with sort of a redneck owl perched on uh, the bacon tree, uh, grape soda uh, lake back there. But I thought I'd play a couple of minutes of gameplay here with my favorite character. Uh, maybe out of any character I've ever written, the one that I was most pleased with, we're going to meet a guy here by the name of the Ice Cream Wizard here in the junk food forest. What's up? Why, the sky is up, young lady. The sun is up. And my hopes are up that you'll ask a more interesting question. Sir, so, are you some kind of wizard? Are you some kind of genius? Of course I'm a wizard. Have you ever seen someone who wasn't not a wizard addressed this way? Wasn't not a what now? <sighs> Never mind. Yes, I am a wizard. Moreover, I am an ice cream wizard. In fact, I'm the ice cream wizard. I specialize in the arcane art of ice cream wizardry. So, what kind of powers does it give you? What kind of powers doesn't it give me? Can you call it the double negatives? I will never not call it, for I am the ice cream wizard. Yeah, I got that. What can you do with your mighty ice cream powers? Power! Power is the end to which all men aim, and I possess the greatest power of all. Love. No, you nincompoop. The power to summon ice cream. And the power to tolerate an endless barrage of questions, it seems. So, can you summon ice cream for me? Why, what kind of ice cream wizard would the ice cream wizard be if he couldn't summon you up an ice cream, young lady? Not an ice cream wizard at all. No, certainly not the ice cream wizard. So what flavours can you do? Do. I do far more than simply do, young lady. A ditch digger does. A simple farmhand does. I don't do... I delicately pluck at the celestial threads that weave together the tapestry of our infinite universe, like a lutist plucks at the strings of his instrument. Only in place of a ballad, I produce the sweet harmony of cream, sugar and coldness that you mortals call ice cream. You're immortal. I haven't died yet, have I? This goes on uh, forever. Eventually, you basically just have to exhaust the ice cream wizard in order to get him to make you some rum raisin ice cream, which then you have to somehow drain the ice cream out of, leaving rum behind so you can give it to a drunkard to get an item from him that you need to solve another puzzle. If you play many adventure games, this sort That's of moon logic, <laughs> crazy solutions, kind of par for the course in the genre. Um, but this is a game where you can see we up the production values a little bit. It's still uh, pretty rough around the edges. Uh, this is still definitely, you know, a game jammy kind of game. But uh, it was a lot of growth for our team. It was an opportunity to really stretch ourselves a little bit, especially when you get to hear this sort of stuff acted out uh, in full voice. That's especially fun. This is a game that ended up winning a couple of awards for the game jam it was part of. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's one that I'm still pretty proud of. An Ice Cream Wizard uh, is, uh, for me, one of the highlights of it. Or he may be the most annoying character ever created, depending on your perspective. Probably the game uh, that I've worked on that's received the most attention um, is a game called Stair Quest. 
This came out in 2016, and it goes back uh, to my roots in a real way. I mentioned games like King's Quest and Space Quest, those old parser-driven uh, adventure games where you actually had to type in what you wanted to do and move your character around with the cursor keys. Uh, 16 color graphics, difficult controls, frustrating gameplay. Lots of death. Lots of death. Every time you take a wrong turn, there's a good chance you'll fall off the edge of something or some bad guy will jump out of nowhere and kill you. Uh, they are punishing. Everything we know about game design nowadays, about how to make a game engaging and fun for players, it didn't apply. It didn't really apply. They kind of flew in the face of that sort of stuff. I mean, these are games that uh, make you wonder if they just hated you as the player uh, as you're playing through them. So I started thinking, what if we made a game that was nothing but the worst parts of a genre that I loved growing up? What if we took a game that took all the worst of these frustrating gameplay elements and made that the entire game. We get rid of all the charming stuff, like the storylines and the characters and everything else. What if we just made a game where all you do is climb stairs? And those stairs are so narrow and so difficult to uh, navigate that you're gonna fall off of them. You're going to die quite a bit. It's almost like a 8-bit Dark Souls kind of experience, a punishing uh, trudge. Uh, through gameplay. And my thinking was, if I can make a game that's so awful, but somehow people decide it's worth playing, yeah, this could be a fun experiment. So, so I'm just thinking more like, this is like the adventure game where you want to be the guy. <laughs> yeah, so I came up with Stair Quest. Let me show you a little bit what Stair Quest That's starting to so break on the right there? Let's, oh, was there actually an end? Let's take it down here. There we go. Okay, let's see. Slow show. Okay, let's go. Okay. 
something even for me, I've played this game more than anybody beta testing and stuff. I think it's me on average like 12 or 13 tries just to get through this level. There are about 10 more levels after this. We start adding things like slippery ice floors eventually to make it even worse. It gets brutal, uh, suffice it to say. That's what we were going for. And what I wondered was, once we released this, will anyone want to play a game that looks so out of date, that you know sounds like a game from the 80s, looks like a game from the 80s, plays like a game from the 80s in the very worst sense of the word, uh, will anybody get what I'm going for here? And we were lucky, uh, my team and I, in the sense that we ended up getting a fair bit of uh, media coverage for this. Um, gaming sites decided this was kind of an interesting idea. Finally, an old school adventure game that's nothing but stairs. Uh, 80s Gaming Nightmare returns to haunt us all, says Kotaku. <laughs> um, StairQuest captures the rage of stair climbing in early adventure games. Uh, people got the joke, and I'll be honest, there were times when we were working on this. This is a game jam game too, we did it in two weeks. About a week into this, I was like, what are we doing? Why do I have like six other people working on this crazy fever dream that I had? Nobody is going to get this joke. Uh, 
media started covering, that led to people doing Let's Plays of it. If you've watched a lot of Let's Plays, Let's Plays of games that are frustrating tend to be pretty fun to watch, where you're getting to see the Let's Player scream and curse and, you know, throw their mouse and stuff like that. It, it started uh, producing a lot of those, so that was fun to watch too, seeing people, um, seeing people deal with this frustration. It would be cool if I said I didn't watch every single Let's Play that was done of this game, but I have watched every single Let's Play of this game just so I can watch people hate me for coming up with the idea of the game. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. So these are the three games that I've worked on. I've got a couple other games in development now, and I've mentioned a few of them as we move forward. But I think this is a good point to pause and talk about what I do in terms of game development. Specifically, here's a short list of things I don't know anything about. Coding, uh, composing music, doing art or graphics. Uh, that's not my contribution on these sorts of projects. I do game design in the sense, in the very broad sense of coming up with ideas for the games. I do a lot of the writing for my team when it comes to actually providing the dialogue we need. And if anything, we don't have formal titles on my team, uh, but I work almost, I would say, as kind of a producer in the sense of trying to come up with timetables, dividing up labor, those sorts of things to help get games finished. And those are some of the things I think I do know a little bit about. I think I can share some wisdom in those areas. My experience is in writing, my experience is in managing a team. And I've had a little bit of luck getting some of my games noticed, especially Stair Quest. This is all, again, coming from the limited experience of an indie game designer making non-commercial games. Uh, but what I've come up with are seven tips that I think can be useful when we start thinking about making our own small indie games. My first tip, there's no substitute for good planning. Plan ahead, planning carefully, oftentimes the difference between a successful game and something that falls apart before it's finished, especially if you're doing a game jam where time may be tight. The more you can think about what you're doing ahead of time and sort of work out those plans, they're, they're better. That way you aren't spending time when the clock's ticking. Uh, when my team was working on StairQuest, we drew up so many crazy design documents. Uh, you wouldn't think a game like this would need much in the way of design documents, but one of my artists came up with this is like, well, what does a level in this game even look like? Well, there's gonna be a place where you come into the uh, uh, level. There are going to be some stairs, obviously. Down here's death. Uh, if you stand off of them. Uh, what's that? Because of course there is. Because of course there is. That's the whole point of the game. Uh, that's not stairs over there, I suppose. Every level has non-stair distractions. The thing here represented by Hello Kitty Pez Dispenser. <laughs> we have everything from llamas in some of the levels. There's a level that has like 40 cats that you have to walk around without stepping on to get up some stairs. Well, uh, you, step on them. Uh, you trip over them and die. Uh, <laughs> everything leads to death if you do it wrong. Concept art, making asset lists, building puzzle dependency charts, working out the division of labor, planning is the key to success with any game. Small, large, one you're making over the course of a weekend, one you might be spending months or even, uh, even a year on. Second tip that I would share. Try to start with some sort of compelling hook, something that in a sentence or so is going to get people interested in your project. Um, in Hollywood, they sometimes call these elevator pitches. Come up with some sort of way to get people you know, interested quickly, because as you know, if you spend any time on Steam, probably 4,000 games have come out since I started this talk today. Right? That's the world of indie game development today. There's so much, it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. Our pitch for StairQuest uh, was basically the idea of, yeah, what if you took the very worst of an 80s adventure game and that was the entire game? Uh, for Pledge Quest, the idea was, you know, there's this group of fans making a game to support a Kickstarter, and they did it in 48 hours. That sort of hook hopefully gets people interested because that's what gets media to cover it. That's what gets people to play your games to something else. We didn't figure out the hook on Late Last Night, that second game that I showed, until afterwards. I think when I called it a drunken Alice in Wonderland, that would have been a pretty good pitch. I think we stumbled onto that months after it came out, 
And it was probably a little bit too late. It was a game that flew under the radar when I think in a lot of ways it may be one of the best things we've worked on. So definitely, yeah, find a hook, something that sets your game apart from the thousands of other games that are going to be made this year. This Tip, week. What's that? This week. This week, exactly. Tip three, let the technology guide your design sources. Know the limitations of your technology and work within those limitations. Uh, when we were working on Stairquest, we tried to limit ourselves wherever possible to a 16-color palette to keep it as authentic as we could to those, uh, those old games. We cheated here and there, but certainly most of the levels are 16 colors. We have one level that's only four colors. We went back to a CGA palette uh, for one of the levels just for fun. Uh, there are only so many things we could do working within the confines of our engine, and then the key becomes knowing what the limits of your technology are, whether you're using Unity or you know whatever development platform we're using something called Adventure Game Studio here. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a pretty easy uh, easy piece of software to work with, especially if you're developing these sorts of games. Although it seems to remember saying something you actually made like an entire platform that thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this is something that once you know the limitations, then it's up to you to come with creative solutions to work around those limitations. Our original pitch for StairQuest was way more ambitious. I said. I want to do this in HTML5. Bad idea off the start. And then the idea is going to be, why don't we set it up so that when someone types something in the parser that the game doesn't recognize, it logs that into a text file, and then we go in every week or two, see what everybody's typed into it that we didn't have a response to, add those responses to the game, and then it's sort of every week or two the game's smarter and it understands more and more, and I liked that idea. I thought that was kind of cool. I thought that was sort of a neat hook. An adventure game that's parser gets smarter as it goes. Not magically through artificial intelligence. We'd be doing it in sort of the hard way behind the scenes. But we started realizing, uh, figuring out how to do this in HTML5 and figuring out how to make this work. Uh, we'd be reinventing the wheel eight or nine times over to make this game happen. I loved that feature, but we eventually dumped it so we could actually release this game. We'd probably still be working on getting uh, StairQuest working uh, in some sort of reasonable order today if we hadn't sort of given in to working within the confines of the technology we had at our disposal. And that kind of brings me to my next point. Don't be afraid to walk away from an idea that isn't working. This is one of the hardest things to do. We know this from game design, we know this from when you're working on a research paper for a class and you've written two or three pages that now you realize probably aren't doing any good and you have to delete all of that research that you've kind of fallen in love with. It's painful. Uh, but it's important to realize when something isn't working and walk away from it. I want to tell you about something I've never talked about before in public. I've never shared this with anyone but my design team. But I made a pitch for a game I desperately wanted to make. Uh, a few years ago with my team. Right after StairQuest came out, I was sort of riding high on the success there, and I pitched a game called Super George Washington's Brother. Oh dear. Yeah, the concept here is, it's going to be a Mario-style platformer starring John Augustine Washington, uh, the brother of President George Washington. And the concept's gonna be, John Augustine uh, Washington pictured here, uh, was the secret hero of the revolution, but everyone's forgotten about him. And every level is going to be a major battle from the Revolutionary War, presented in the style of a Mario game with power-ups and crazy enemies and hopping on British redcoats' heads in order to defeat them. I was kind of in love with this idea. And I think I may have pressured my team into pretending like they loved it too. And what we did from there is we started drawing up some concept art. We worked on a design document. Uh, we even put together a basic prototype. And it just wasn't clicking. Uh, the team wasn't exciting, wasn't excited about it. The gameplay wasn't sure you know, exactly if it was fitting together. Uh, well, I started to wonder, is this just a hook? You remember I said you need a hook to make the game successful? Is this just a hook with no actual game behind it? I think I came up with a clever idea but in terms of turning it into a game that people want to play, there's a reason Shovel Knight is such a you know, popular platformer because it's really good. It's not easy to make good platformers, right? It's easy to throw together a platformer. There are a million engines out there that can do that for you. 
but one that plays well, people are want, going to want to engage with, that's hard to come by. And we weren't making progress there like we wanted. Uh, we might come back to Super George Washington's brother someday. For now, it's just living on my hard drive as a set of design documents and concept arts. Right now, my team's working on a point-and-click adventure game about, um, about a professional wrestler called uh, The Adventures of Becky Wrestlehard, uh, which is based on a character that my daughter created when she and I play pro wrestling together. She inhabits a character named Becky Wrestlehard, who is the hardest wrestler there is. Uh, and I thought, why not make a game about that? Uh, and I think my team's humoring me there, too. When it comes to teams, trust your teams, let them create. As I said, I'm managing a lot of these projects, but if you sat me down and asked me to write a simple if-then-else statement, I'm in the dark. I don't code. I took one coding class in college, and I failed it. I literally failed. Uh, it was Pascal, Turbo Pascal, a very simple, very old language that a small child should be able to master. I was unable to do that. I'm not artistic uh, in the traditional sense. I'm not someone who is going to be able to compose music. I've assembled a team around me, people that I've known for years, the name of our studios, no more for today. Uh, this is key when you're working with a team. Let them create. Uh, I would occasionally come up with an idea for a character, like that ice cream wizard. Uh, and I had a way I imagined the ice cream wizard looking in my head. I handed over to my artist, he came back with something that looked quite a bit different than what I'd imagined, but I have to trust him. That's his area of expertise, and let him create. Let him make this his own, in much the same way that the voice actor and the people composing the music and everything else. If you let them shine, if you let them be creative and do their thing, trust them to be the artists they are, that's going to make a game better overall. Trying to micromanage that sort of stuff, I think, takes away from these games. I'm lucky, I have a pretty talented team. Um, one of our team members is actually an animator at Disney now. He wasn't when he started working with me. I've known him for years. He now works on the Disney program, Elena of Avalor. And he does a lot of our art. Uh, that's kind of nice when you have someone with that sort of experience doing your stair climbing art uh, for you. Uh, we're sort of lucky in that regard. But yeah, giving your team the freedom to do their best work is going to create the best game. Tip six, nobody cares about your indie game as much as you do. This is true, this will always be true. If you aren't passionate about your game, certainly nobody else is going to be, and no matter what, nobody is going to care about this game nearly as much as you will. That means you're going to have to hustle to get people to want to play it, to get people to pay attention to it. You have to be willing to shamelessly promote the heck out of yourself, which is not a comfortable thing to do. Hit up social media. Ideally, if you design a game you want a lot of people to play, you need to get uh, coverage from the real media as well. <laughs> this is an email uh, that I sent to, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 websites after StairQuest came out. Basically, in the form of a press release. I worked on this uh, for quite a while, trying to frame the game uh, in the best way I could come up with, uh, giving them some easy bullet points that they can work from. I attached screenshots, I attached gameplay videos. I kind of gave them everything I could and emailed it out to every gaming website, every gaming magazine, every weird nerd news website, every retro game site. I just sort of blanketed it in the hopes that some of these sites would give it coverage. And a few did. And a lot of that's just because basically I, I hounded them, and that's not uh, that's not fun to do. The, the reality is websites need content, and you need coverage, so the key is presenting your game in such a way that they want to cover it, and part of that comes down to having a really good hook, which goes back to one of our other earlier points. My final tip, your game only want, gets one chance to make a first impression. We didn't put our best foot forward on that second game I showed late last night, the drunken uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, game. The initial release was for a game jam, we finished it in two weeks, but the game we really wanted to make with voices and some additional puzzles, some additional characters, didn't come out until a year later. That took us a lot longer, uh, trying to record voices, 
with a cast of a dozen or more people all across the world and then edit them and work on the levels and get it to something that sounds halfway decent. That's a lot of work. By the time that version that we loved came out, the buzz was gone. Huge disappointment for us. Not many people played the talky version of that, the one with voices, the one that we loved and the one that we were proud of because the buzz was gone. With StairQuest, we tried to go above and beyond. Things like designing retro box art. If you remember that King's Quest box from back in the beginning, this very closely mimics the style of that. We brought in artists to help us come up with that figuring. This is the sort of thing that websites might like to use as a header <coughs> image. Um, we put together a proper trailer. We designed a retro game manual uh, that, uh, that came with the game. All that sort of stuff adds to the overall package. It makes a splash. It makes your game stand out from all the others that are out there. Present your game in the best light from the start. That's probably the, the advice I would take away there. So these seven tips, again, they're from my experience. And a lot of these are far from technical. They're certainly not getting into the nitty gritty of making a game. But from my standpoint as someone who designs games and then tries to manage a team that works on those games, I think there's some stuff uh, worth working with here. Uh, my own work, increasingly, I'm doing research and I'm teaching classes on game studies. Uh, I said I wouldn't plug my website earlier, but I will plug a course that I'm offering uh, next semester. I'm going to be teaching a game called uh, Politics and Video Games. It's a special topics out of the political science department where we'll start to explore both the politics of the game industry, of gaming culture, as well as how video games have represented various themes uh, surrounding politics uh, through the years. It's open to all majors, no prerequisites. Um, I definitely invite any of you who might be interested. Uh, think about signing up. I'm hoping it's going to be a fun class that's successful. It's something that may go on the books permanently here at Marshall. Also, I like the name of the ice. I, I see, I see that and I'm just thinking, you're a very, very dedicated nerd. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely a dedicated nerd. My life is nothing but nerdy pursuits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've decided I'm just going to embrace that and make it part of what I do here at my real job. It used to be I had my day job where I was, I wouldn't say a serious professor, but I was a professor and then I had to step out down the side, my geeky uh, pursuits. I've kind of decided to merge those into one the last few years and if I had to give you any other tip, uh, it might be, if you can make a career out of doing this sort of stuff you love, uh, it's a fantastic experience to have. This is something that I've been lucky enough, my department has let me do crazy stuff like travel to conferences to talk about soda machines and video games and teach classes like this that fall pretty far outside of the mainstream of what political science is all about. So. Yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty great. This for me is, has been a fun experience. Again, to talk to you guys here tonight uh, as well. Um, and that's kind of all I have to say as far as my tips, what I've learned about game design. Uh, do we have time still for question and answer? I know we ran a little long. Yeah. All right. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand. Yeah. Yes. Do you have those slides up anywhere online? Uh, I can put them up. Uh, probably what I'll do is uh, there at my Twitter uh, later this, uh, this evening. I will probably provide a Dropbox link uh, to them. Um, I can also send some to uh, Tim if he wants to circulate to everybody. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to retweet his stuff as well, so, because cool. I've got the controller account, so. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, other questions? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, uh, so, so uh, just out of the curiosity, but what was, well, like, what was the, well, think about it when you come back to you, definitely. Yeah, of course. I was going to ask, um, so, you, uh, so you've got like, a lot of inspiration from a lot of those old kind of games, and specifically mm -hmm. Monkey Island. Um, with, okay, so design talk, why did, you, did, why did you decide to go backwards from the um, action verb script box that Monkey Island kind of pioneered and set forward for like, mm -hmm. that was like the second half of the like adventure game kind of industry? Why did you like strip that out when you were making your game? Okay. Was it, was it a time restriction or was it like... Like for stair quest or when we went back to the, 
So the typing interface? Yeah, like, okay. Uh, like I can understand the typing, but before uh -huh. when you were still doing the cursor kind of uh, images, why were you? Why did you strip out that kind of box element? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, what we were using uh, in Pledge Quest uh, was more of the yeah. Sierra model, where it was move to the top of the screen, a set of icons appear there, and then you interact there. With um, late last night, we used what's called a verb coin, where when you would right click, it would pull up a list of all of your sorts of options there. It works more or less the same, but rather than requiring you to mouse to the top of the screen, mouse back down and click on something, a right click allows you to interact with it more immediately. That was in large part the Monkey Island influence coming through for me. Monkey Island 3, uh, Curse of Monkey Island, used a similar interface. I think it may have pioneered the verb coin interface because it used a literal image of a gold doubloon or, uh, doubloon or a coin there. Uh, to do so. So, yeah, we wanted to evoke a little bit of that feel. That game was definitely more, you know, if you know much about the history of these adventure games, two of the companies that produced some of the more popular ones were Sierra Online. They get, did games like Space Quest, King's Quest. Uh, LucasArts did games like Monkey Island and, uh, and Maniac Mansion and others like that. For that game, we really wanted to get more of a LucasArts vibe, so we went with the verb point there. And then when it came to the Stair Quest, I desperately wanted to have a text parser. I'd always like the challenge of figuring out, can I anticipate the things that people will type on these levels and come up with as many unique responses to them as possible? And, and also because it, you're making an adventure game meant to, meant to make people frustrated. You wouldn't get very far doing that if you're doing it in the side of LucasArts. Yes, no, that's true. LucasArts, their whole design philosophy was don't frustrate people. So we're wanting to go back to the how do you frustrate people. Uh, that parser is so jamongous. It's ridiculous how much time we spent on it. Uh, in the sense of we came up with over a hundred verbs uh, that we wrote responses for. We tried to give specific responses to each individual item on screen for all of those verbs for every level of the game. When we didn't, we tried to at least script things that would handle when the game recognized the verb, but it didn't recognize the noun that came after it, so it would still sound like it was understanding you. Uh, we, uh, we went above and beyond. And for what it's worth, you only need one command to beat the game. Uh, you get to the top of the mountain and you type get orb, and that's literally the only command the game needs to be completed. All of those others were just in there to amuse us and to amuse players, because that was part of the challenge. Can we make a game which just got this massive text parser that you don't need to do anything with. It's completely extraneous to the gameplay experience itself. So, yeah, thank you. How big has your team been? Has it changed much over the years? The first couple of games that we started with, uh, Pledge Quest 1, Pledge Quest 2, as I mentioned, that was a two-man team. And you know, I mentioned my limited skill set. So two-man team in this case, or two-person team, uh, in this case means that I'm writing the dialogue, you're kind of coming up with the puzzle design and everything. And then my partner, uh, who lives in California, uh, her name is, uh, is Jess also, uh, she would be responsible for the art, the music, uh, doing all the coding, everything else. She was a powerhouse. I don't know how she did it. Our time zone thing would mean like, I would go to bed by sending her a bunch of things like, here's what I finished today, and I would wake up in the morning and she would have another prototype up and running. So, uh, you know, I may be the designer of that game, but she did a lot of heavy lifting. We've grown, uh, late last night, as far as the design team, we had a few more once we started doing voice work. I think there were five of us on that. StairQuest had six. So it's still a relatively small team. We have a couple of people that do art, a music guy, a uh, couple of coders, um, and then everyone pitches in with a little bit of writing here and there. Other questions? Yes. Uh, favorite game from the past, like, five years? Oh my gosh. I play a lot of Overwatch. Like, a troubling amount of Overwatch. <laughs> um, I just, the other day, made the mistake of looking at my career profile and realized I had logged 300 hours on just Lucio, uh, <laughs> one of the support characters in that game. That is... A, a, a troubling investment of time. I play a lot of Overwatch. I'm a big fan of, uh, of the Fallout series. Those are always sort of uh, 
perennial winners. Um, I follow a lot of point and click adventure games still that uh, that come out. There's a lot of great stuff that uh, Wadget Eye Games, a development studio, um, I think out of New York, does uh, does some pretty fantastic stuff. But yeah, for the last like two years, I've been deep in the world of Overwatch. Um. <clears throat> So you, you did say you played the Fallout series, mm -hmm. so, and you've probably noticed some of the changes that they've done from the third iteration to the fourth. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten criticism from games that you have made, and how do you deal with that criticism? <laughs> I've been pretty lucky in the sense that I think being low-profile games, most people see them as like, this is probably somebody's labor of love, and I didn't pay for it, so I'm not going to be too mean to them. I've been lucky not to get people yelling at me on social media. And the ones who do yell at me because of StairQuest and they're doing it in the spirit of the game. It's just like, oh my god, I hate you, smiley face. Uh, which is the kind of response I wanted there. I wanted, I hate you, and I'm, you know, I wish you were dead, smiley face, winky face. But sort of there was, uh, the answer I was looking for there. I want people to be frustrated, but get it. Um, the few times we have gotten negative feedback, I will say um, I'm a sensitive soul. Like, I, I, I really, uh, you know, I, I'm not cut out for any larger scale game development because, like, one negative comment, and I'm like, oh, we just take the download off of the, off of the website. Just, you know, it's like, just throw it in the garbage, which is not the way to handle this sort of thing. You know, that's, you know, that's advice I can give. Don't be like me and let the sort of negative feedback get you down. Um, you know, for everybody that uh, dislikes a game, you're going to have your fans as well. And focus on the positive stuff. Don't read the comments. Uh, I read every comment. I read everything anybody ever says about me on the internet because, I don't know, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. And I wouldn't recommend that attitude uh, if I could help it. Hey, I saw another hand back there a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah, um, do you work more with like engines or like programming, like coding or whatnot? We have done all three of our games so far in Adventure Game Studio, which is a pretty simple freeware um, engine. It's uh, it's easy to work with. The drawback is it's pretty old and creaky. Um, getting it to run in modern resolutions can be a little tricky. Um, it's uh, it's showing its age a little, which. It's fine if you want to do a game that looks like it was released in 1986. That's not such a problem. If you want to do a modern game, it takes a lot more work. But so far, we've only worked in uh, in engines. Uh, we have some pretty talented uh, programmers, people who do that full time in their day job. Uh, but so far, we haven't, uh, in that sort of spirit of letting the technology guide our design, working with what we know is where we've gone. We have started to experiment a little bit with Unity. It has some packages you can download to make these sort of point-and-click adventures. So what's all like the uh, programming language that you've ever worked with? Personally, um, as I said, I had one class of Turbo Pascal that I failed. Um, I did some basic code, like literally basic, yeah. like back in the 80s, like with a guidebook on how to like yeah. you know, make my computer basically say hello world, uh, stuff like that. I am literally the worst coder on the planet. I, I could not uh, stress enough my limited experience there. The rest of my team, I mean, they are people who do this professionally. One of our guys that does coding has worked doing this sort of stuff at uh, game studios that worked on 3DS games and uh, and a lot of other stuff like that. So they are pretty top notch. Um, and up to this point, we've kind of gone with Adventure Game Studio because we know the ins and outs of it and know what we can make it do. So. Yeah. Um, do you have any recommendations as to how to like get publicity for your stuff outside of like emailing every single like game journalism website in existence? I think that's uh, I think that's a good a good starting point. You know, something that is useful, and this all sounds gross because you don't want to like say I'm making friends for the purposes of advancing my careers. Uh, I shouldn't say that way, but. Being engaged online in communities of people who love the same things you do. You know, I ran a website about adventure games going back to 1995. So I kind of had this network of friends that followed me from old message forums and IRC chat channels all the way up through more modern forms of social media. And what that means is you kind of have like a cheering section. You release a game. They're going to retweet it, uh, retweet it, we, uh, retweet it uh, and help spread that sort of news. 
in much the same way, reaching out to people who are doing work that uh, that you enjoy, letting them know who you are, letting them know what you're working on. Um, I would say that's a useful outlet as well. Good word of mouth um, is just as valuable as uh, as media coverage in a lot of ways. And the way you do that is just start building those bonds and those networks and become part of the communities that are already full of people who are probably going to like what you're doing anyway. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say that I, uh, oh, it was a recommendation. Uh, I remember seeing a game called Peasant's Quest that I think it might be. Yes. Mm-hmm. I really like Peasant's Quest. Peasant's Quest was a game, I don't know how many of you, because I'm very old and you're very young, uh, are familiar with Homestar Runner. Uh, yeah, the Homestar Runner people released a game uh, called Peasant's Quest that was very much in the vein of what I was doing in Stair Quest. It wasn't just the stair climbing stuff, but it definitely was going back to those very basic 16 color graphics, the awful PC speaker sort of sound effects, the whole bit. And using that, yeah, I see it up on screen over here. It's a lot of fun. You can play it in browser. Check it out. It's pretty hilarious. There are walkthroughs available because it's a little bit uh, yeah, difficult actually, to get through. Yeah, no, actually, I was going on Central a little, little bit. Yes, yeah, it's, like, it's like a very detailed, you know, like going like, here's all of the dialogue things that you can find. Yes, and it was a big inspiration. Uh, you know, that idea that, you know, and actually I had some people say, probably some of the meaner comments I got about StairQuest was just like, I liked it better when it was called Peasant's Quest. And I get it. Uh, we were both trying to do the same thing of paying homage to the games we loved as kids, I think, me and the Homestar Runner guys. Uh, but, you know, they definitely took theirs a little bit different way than we did. But no, that's, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I definitely like Peasant's Quest. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> yes? Uh, the logo for your studio is an owl. What made you want to be an owl or where did that come from? Uh, the owl thing um, is based in part, uh, you may have noticed in the uh, scene from late last night, there's the owl perched on the, uh, on the bacon tree there. Uh, there was a character in the game King's Quest V uh, named oh. Cedric the Owl, uh, which if you just Google him, there's lots of his highlights on YouTube. He's basically this incredibly annoying owl who's supposed to be your partner on your quest, to offer you helpful hints and help you solve puzzles. But all he does is sort of complain and he talks in this terrible falsetto voice of, Oh, Graham, I wouldn't go in there. It looks dangerous. And yeah, just, yeah, just imagine playing for hours with that sort of companion. And we all had all of my team had come up playing these sorts of games and all shared sort of a mutual hatred of Cedric. So when we created la late last night, the uh, the bird perched in the bacon tree there is kind of like a foul-mouthed, really offensive, um, somewhat sexist parody of uh, of this Cedric character who is just a complete jerk, still talking in that falsetta uh, sort of voice. And we liked him so much, we were like, eh, let's just slap his uh, sort of an owl logo onto the studio. And we've stuck with that ever since. So yeah, that was us parodying an obscure character from a game from like 1992. That nobody liked. <laughs> that nobody liked, yeah, exactly. Which is kind of perfect because nobody likes our games really either. Yes? Speaking of the 90s, what would you say is your favorite game from the 90s era of a game? So N64, anything that came out? You know, I've always been more of a PC gamer than a console guy. I've dabbled in consoles along the way. Um, but definitely more of a PC gamer. Um, Secret of Monkey Island uh, is a huge one. That was 1990. Uh, Mario 64, I think, is still just a remarkably brilliant game. When you play Odyssey today, it's amazing how much of the DNA from Mario 64 is still intact. Even the control scheme is virtually unchanged decades down the road. Um, i trying to think of some other favorites along the way. I played kind of every point-and-click adventure I get my hands on. You mentioned earlier the Quest for Glory series. Those are uh, those are major favorites of mine, too. Uh, those would be an RPG slash adventure games. I remember playing the, the guy, like, I remember seeing a remake of the second one that I played a little of. Yeah, I know some of the guys who worked on that. They did some pretty fantastic work. There, there have been a lot of 
remakes of these old games using more modern technology that are pretty neat out there, available for free download as well. Other questions? <laughs> yes? Do you all do Kickstarters or do you just do it for uh, free? We've, we've just done it in our spare time so far. We've talked about a Kickstarter. We've uh, talked about maybe going commercial with our next game. Uh, it will still probably be short. It'll probably still be small. I'm pushing for like a 99 cent or 2.99 price point. Not so much to make money on it, more so just to say, hey, we did a commercial game and to get experience with that part of game development because I really don't know how the money side of it works yet. So my thinking was, you know, a low risk entry might be the way to go. And if that sort of stuff moves forward well, if we ever decide to try a more ambitious game where we maybe need to pay people to not work their other full-time jobs full-time. Kickstarter might be something we think about in the future, but for now we haven't uh, we haven't given it a try. A lot of people in the adventure game community have turned to Kickstarter and have had some, uh, some good uh, results with it. Other questions? Yes? Have you played Adventure Quest? Adventure Quest? I don't think I have. It's um, it's like an old Flash game. Uh-huh. Uh, they've actually updated it. There's a 3D version now, but it's like mm -hmm. a browser-based game. You just it's got like the typical RPG classes, thief, mm -hmm. and you've got like different magical abilities. But it's really cool. You might like it. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. No, that sounds interesting. It's Battlelon.com. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you said you were a big, like, like primarily a big computer gamer, even like back in the 80s. Uh huh. Uh, did you ever dabble into like the Command and Conquer series or StarCraft or anything? I did a little bit. Um, sort of my RTS um, experience, um, I played the Warcraft games uh, 1 through 3 and then got pretty addicted mm -hmm. to World of Warcraft eventually. I, I took an extra year to finish my PhD because I didn't work on it to play World of Warcraft instead. I have no regrets. I think it's important to know. Uh, that was time well spent. But yeah, in the RTS uh, realm, I played a lot of Warcraft, played a little bit of StarCraft. I really like Total Annihilation, which was uh, maybe a little bit, I think it's a series that's lesser known these days, but had some pretty cool stuff with like destructible environments and yeah. things like that. But no, I, I definitely like that genre. A little bit of Command and Conquer. Uh, not as much as some of the others. It was sort of a function a lot of times of what game was I owned and my friend's own, so we could play them head to head when possible. Over modems, the old fashioned oh, way. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I never got to experience that. Well, uh, you are missing. Yeah. I will say, I was just at Goodwill out in Barbersville um, two nights ago. They have a 56K modem just sitting out there. If anyone ever wants to buy one, you can just dial up and uh, we'll play some Warcraft 2 uh, and, uh, and have a good time. Um, What's the most obscure game that you know that you've played? Like, the thing that if you were to mention it in a casual conversation, you'd be most surprised that the other person knew what you were talking about. You know, nowadays a lot of these point-and-click games that I've mentioned um, are pretty obscure. I played a lot of uh, text-based games back in the 80s, too. Um, a lot of you maybe have heard of Zork, uh, which was one of the first of these text-based interactive fictions. I played a lot of games from that company, Infocom, so they're ones that maybe people don't talk about as much nowadays. Uh, but I'm old enough at this point that most people my age have either outgrown gaming or just died of old age. Um, so uh, it's easy uh, kind of to, to come across games that are obscure that I still have memories of from my childhood. Any other questions? Have uh, you ever thought about making a game that, like, a game that is important quick? I'd like to. You know, that was part of what we were going for um, when I was thinking about the Super George Washington Brother game. Um, I was hoping to, because I mean, in a lot of ways, StairQuest is closer to a platformer. It's about your reflexes and your movement skills more so than any sort of puzzle solving. It looks like one of those games, but it plays like something that doesn't fit in that genre easily. So. Yeah, kind of what um, I was thinking with the Super George Washington's brother was what if we could do a really cool platformer and show people that, yeah, we're a bunch of adventure game fans who work on adventure games or released adventure games, but we've got something else in us. And I think what we came back to is we found our strengths were in adventure games. I think one of the things we found was all of us love to write, and we like to write comedy uh, is something else we've come across. 
I've pitched some fairly serious games. I pitched a zombie apocalypse game set here in West Virginia called Holler at one point that I'm still kind of excited about. It was uh, a game that I'd like to come back to someday. Uh, but it was going to be a fairly serious take on an adventure game genre. And all of us like making dumb jokes too much, uh, I think, to, to walk away from it. So those narrative games really, I think, still click with.